So excellent. Declan, you can see the I can see it absolutely fine. Thank Perfect. You. Okay. Over to you, Mark. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for the uh, introduction. Uh, I'm happy to be here. As uh, was mentioned, we're going to talk about psychological functioning uh, with a particular focus on hostile environments. And we're going to talk about stress as a concept. And I know with Co-Create and the previous webinars, which I've seen, we're trying to build up a, a sort of a webinar information that people can look back into and watch the records and find things about. So any questions you have going through this, please just put it up in the chat bar and we'll get to them. Hopefully I'll be able to answer them all. If I can't, I promise I'll get back. Uh, and I'm going to go probably, possibly touch on a few subjects we've already talked about because I like the continuity of what we're doing to show that it's not just burnout here, hostile environments there a bit of post-traumatic stress disorder, that it's it's all entangled and wrapped up and actually we can learn from little bits. So I'll touch on other people's uh, webinars, but only, only briefly, and I'll try and focus on mine. We can go to the next slide now, please. Mm -hmm. There we are. Ah, there we are, excellent. We're going to have to keep doing this now because Christoph is my able helper. Uh, a bit of my background, why I should be talking about this or you know why it might be of interest. Uh, I worked in the UK in the National Health Service uh, as most people in my background did and I trained as a counsellor and a psychotherapist primarily and I worked specialised in working with child and adolescent mental health and I worked in particular with violence uh, and from that I grew into volunteering for uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, and I went there immediately after the tsunami uh, in Indonesia. Uh, a bit of time in Bandar Aceh, which is very, very everyone sort of recognises, and then I went to a different part of the coast where I spent six months training with two colleagues, trained uh, eight local psychologists in post-traumatic stress and how to deal with it, uh, did outreach in lots of communities, put in the clinic, and when I came back, I became independent uh, because I had this background now. Uh, and I went to work for uh, various companies specializing really in violence, trauma and the effects. I have a slight specialism in critical incidents, so terror attacks. I worked in London, Kabul, Brussels, all over uh, in response to terror attacks in the last five years or so most of the places I've heard about I've uh, probably been engaged with uh, and I also train people who go and work in these areas in particular uh, humanitarian companies NGOs international NGOs but also conflict journalists so I I suppose as well I, I don't just train in the UK this is slightly more unusual I actually go to hostile environments to train in there so I've been a long tour of Gaza been into Iraq Lagos Lots of places where people can't actually come out because they can't get visas. And so I'll go there and train there. So I have a, a sort of experience and an academic experience about this. A bit more about me is, as you'll see as we go through, I love anything that's outdoors, particularly sports or walking or anything like that. Social occasions. This sort of is a social occasion where I get to speak to people and, and get ideas and learn about things. And I suppose that's what makes me click is I'm fascinated by how we respond and what happens. So that's a bit about me. We'll move on now uh, to the next slide, please. So why should we talk about this? Uh, because people who work, work in humanitarian fields are susceptible. There's increased clinical levels of things like depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, as one might expect, but also that Importantly, this doesn't go away. So when you finish and you go home, you can start a completely different job. This stays with you. It's been shown that the clinical effects are slow to dissipate. So something comes back with us. So we need to think about this. And I want to think about this in terms of when your organization says, go on R&R. &R. Well, we know that it's slow to dissipate post-deployment. We have to think about how do we make R&R &R work? How do we make 
something's happening in the middle of what we're doing work better so we'll touch on ideas like this and i'll give you hopefully some strategies for that uh, a lot of what we talk about will be increased feelings of emotional fatigue leading to distress and i'm going to talk about stress about how we can reimagine stress and it's been shown through i'd have to say emerging science at the moment uh, stuff that's just coming through from some universities uh, that we can control this uh, a little bit on burnout but I'm, I'm not an expert burnout i know kate's here so <laughs> I, won't, I won't try to talk too much about that but there are some ideas about what might help us and will help hopefully when we leave we'll leave with better emotional and mental health and we'll recover quicker on to the next slide please So this is where you can use your chat bar. Uh, this is, I know when I talk about stress and it's constantly evolving in, in my experience of how I think of it. I know what I think about when I say stress. Uh, it's important I know what you mean by stress. So in the chat bar, if people could start to put up uh, words, anything about what they think about stress. What is stress to you? And I'll keep an eye on that and we can go through that. But I'll give you 30 seconds to a minute because you can keep putting them down as well. But how would you know you were stressed? How would you know someone else was stressed? What do you generally think stress is? I'll give you 30 seconds or so. It's interesting to think in terms of physical as well as emotional and mental as well. One of the reasons I uh, I use the athletes, of course, is because that this is taken from the Olympic Games. They are under huge amounts of what we would describe as stress. And yet, if you look at them, they look very relaxed. And so I'm interested in how they do that. If we go on to the next slide, I'll come up with common answers that I get. So just, just keep clicking through and I'll, I'll tell you when to stop as it comes up. And you can stop there. Oops. Oops, back one. Sorry, stop there. <laughs> so these are the, these are the things that I that I get. These are the things that people talk to me about, and I can see some of them coming up already. Uh, anger, sleep problems. I put drinking too much, but any sort of substance abuse, stomach ache, the physical side, loneliness, things like when people talk about stress, not being able to concentrate, poor decision making fast heart rate so lots of these things are kind of how people think about stress but i also get people talking about being able to think quickly that actually at times of stress they can suddenly look and take a lot of information and make decisions and i have to say in my experience when i talk to people who've been through uh, a critical incident as we call it say and that could be a train crash or going uh where there's been a terror attack they talk about suddenly being able to see a lot and move through crowds and, and take good decisions. They find that they can be strong, their heightened awareness. Uh, I'm seeing the ones coming up in the side top. These are all great. You, you sort of do my job for me by putting all these up. But these are the common ones. And we're going to look at this because I have some interesting ideas. I don't have them. Lots of people have them. And I'm just sort of trying to put them out there. We can go on to the next slide now, please. And here's the second thing. I can see now we're kind of in line when we think of stress and the response and how it is. And it's the very common ideas, and that's good. But hostile environments are slightly different. When I talk about hostile environments, I get a, a, a certain set of answers. So I'd like, and I've learned something else, I have to say. I've learned from my experience of being in these environments. Uh, to change that slightly. So again, the same process will just take a minute or two just to think about what does hostile environment mean? How, how do we think when someone says, I'm in a hostile environment, I'm working in a hostile environment, what would you expect? And just, again, if you just take anything that comes into your mind, put it down. There are no right or wrong answers to this one. So anything you think of as a hostile environment is a hostile environment, but go ahead again. And I have some answers prepared, the common things I get. So if uh, 
Christoph, if you just click to the next slide and then give it one click. Common things people think about. And they are hostile environments, threats, violence, environments where there's that. I deal with many people, especially with the journalists who are involved in, work, have to work in crowds and then slash the danger that can become riots and it's work, of just being attacked in hostile environments. And click again, please, Crystal. That's good, I can see the vulnerability, very good. War zones conflict, classic ones where humanitarians might work, where men's chairs, where I worked, uh, anger, danger, these things come up. And again, Christoph, please. <laughs> I've just, yeah, we're going to come to this. I've just seen some of the answers that are really good coming up here. The unknown, fear, remote, you know, people work in very remote places, uh, terrorism, and once more, Christoph. And it's nicely timed where uh, Gossi has just put this up. Hostile environments. Uh, head office, meetings, harassment. And I think this is one of the things I want to concentrate on because very often I get asked to come and speak to people about hostile environments. And because of my background and the nature of the organisations that ask me to speak with them, there's a a sort of perception that what we're going to talk about is the top three on that list. Actually, one of the most stressful places, uh, or hostile places, to say, had high levels of stress in there as well, uh, was in a head office in Washington for a major media organisation. I was speaking to journalists in the office because they were connected to the ones in the field. And it was very hostile. You know, their, their responses were all the things we, we brought up with the stress about fear, loneliness, nerves, feeling physically sick. So actually, it, the hostile environment is our perception. Any environment can be hostile. And I will suggest that sometimes people who work in fields where it might be considered dangerous, they get used to that. People are very resilient and they can tolerate it because they come to understand and expect it. And yet they go home and say R and R afterwards and something comes with them and then they can find things hostile. They can find just having to work in an office for a month or so, incredibly hostile. Deadlines, all the things that raise the response, the stress response. Being in an environment where you're harassed where something's going on there's low level bullying and harassment that's a very hostile environment and the reason i want to kind of push this is because the results are the same when we're thinking about stress anxiety depression that clinical risk your perception of an environment as hostile will have a similar effect and i, and I really push this with particularly with the media organizations i work with and humanitarian organizations that they can't just focus on the field, as it were, for a better word. They have to think about the organisation as a whole, because it can be incredibly hostile, especially, and I hear this quite a lot, when people come back from deployment and they come back and they don't get the support, they don't get listened to, or they come back with an issue they want to talk about and the organisation doesn't want to talk about it incredibly hostile. We can move to the next slide now. That's, that's a very good one about the silence becoming hostile too. I uh, I worked with someone who worked in uh, the Ukraine and actually said when it went quiet, that's when he panicked. When he could hear the artillery, he knew where the artillery was. He knew what was happening. If it didn't happen, he got very worried. So you can get used to it. We're going to separate stress before we go more into, into things you've probably heard about, uh, the two kinds, basically. Uh, and I'm going to think about them. acute stress. And acute stress is quite a lot of what I deal with. It's the experience of witnessing confronted with a traumatic event is an easy way to understand it. And it tends to happen very quickly. It tends to be the car bomb, the attack, the car crash. Everything's okay in your normal day. 
you're thinking about maybe what you're going to have to eat later and everything changes and you get a big rush of adrenaline and the heart races and that heightened awareness comes in and that sudden massive reaction acute stress post-traumatic stress reactions are quite common actually when i go and meet people uh, after an event say armed robberies i used to deal with a lot of armed robberies but things are so secure now it's a lot better very normal the biggest role i have for 97 percent of the people is helping them understand the normal reaction to an abnormal event so acute stress though it it feels powerful uh, physically emotionally mentally actually in some ways is is okay to deal with because as human beings we're very resilient and we can deal with that it's not pleasant to go through but if we go and and allow people to understand what it is and to use their own, their own tools and to help support them with outside. People are pretty resilient at this. So acute stress, though it's the big reaction, some of you may have had this, uh, it's actually okay to sort of deal with. And I think organizations are putting good mechanisms, good strategies to help people who might, and I, very vulnerable to this if you're going to some of these places, actually will be really looking after their staff very well. I have to say, maybe controversially, coming from my side and looking in, I don't see that a great deal. And I, I know there are genuine reasons for that. But I would also suggest there are more that can be done. And I've talked with people about that. And it's not because organisations don't want to help. I understand that. It's sometimes, I think, because they don't quite know what to do. But that's that. If we go to the next slide, we'll talk about the... Uh, sort of stress I'm more concerned about. And just click once more. There we go. I think here, Chekhov summed this up very well. Uh, and it's someone someone gave me this. I didn't find this. I didn't read Chekhov and go, oh, I'll use that in my talk. But it's true. We can face crises. We're, we're resilient. We have done this genetically. Our code is strong for this. That's why we're here. That's why we weren't eaten by the bear. What we're not good at is the day-to-day -day living in a hostile environment, whether that's, again, in an office, at home, where you're having relationship problems or issues, in an area, an environment that is dangerous. The grinding down, the same effects that come from the acute with the adrenaline, the not sleeping, but on a much sort of smaller level where you're normally functioning in a normal way i'd say about three an acute might take you right to the 10 the cumulative you might be at five or six uh, but you function at that without noticing it because it becomes normalized uh, and that's what i think we need to look at that's what we need to do when i'm thinking of humanitarian organizations in particular how do we deal with that because by the nature of the work it's going to be a stressful environment. Most people, where they go to work, and again, I'm going to come back to this, even if you're just doing fundraising, if you're fundraising for an organisation that is going to, say, Yemen and providing water, you know the importance of what happens. You see the pictures, you get read the stories, not being able to get the money. How am I going to do this? That drip, drip, drip of a deadline, did I organize this? Did we get donors in? Did I do that right? It affects everybody. And I think this is a, a big thing that organizations need to look at. And I know Kate, I just think it's burnout. And we think very much the same about this. In fact, lots of people like, I think, think about this and we think it's an organizational, not self, I'm gonna say this, but it's not self-care, it's organizational care. Self-care is just one little bit that helps along. It should be wrapped around with more care. But we're going to talk a bit more about stress and I'm going to try and give you some thoughts and ideas that hopefully will start to change how we think about that. Uh, and this is, I say, this is, oh, one thing lockdown and, and the pandemic has done is given me time to get back to looking at research and to actually talk to people. And people are surprisingly open uh, when you just email them and say, I'm thinking about this. Would you mind answering a question? So what we're going to talk about is a bit of the feedback that I've had, the things that people have told me. 
I have references for all of these. If anyone wants them, I will put them everywhere and I will put the people I like and what they're doing down. And I suggest you can go and hear it from them as well because they really are experts. But let's go on to the next slide. One of the things I want to do is to, because we noticed when asked what is stress, what do we think of stress, and the common answers I get, it's the negative side. When people say stress, they think of distress. They don't think of you stress, the EU stress, the, the kind that is beneficial for us. And so I have a thing about stress. Uh, that when we use it, we, we always, it automatically goes, stress is bad. It's something that's bad that happens to us. What I want to think about now is, let's just reimagine it. Instead of saying, I'm stressed, we, we think of it as a continuum. That there is a low level of stress in our lives and a high level, but we change that to arousal. So we think, I'm not autonomically, I'm not in a state of physical, mental, uh, emotional arousal at the moment. I'm quite relaxed, I'm parasympathetic, and enjoying myself. Something happens, a deadline, an argument, a conversation we know we're going to have to happen now, and our state of arousal goes up. If we think about it like that, we met, might start, and the research and science shows this quite strongly that we start thinking about that when that moment comes that we think of normally as, oh, I'm stressed, this must be distress, it doesn't affect us that much. This idea that we can normalise stress as something that's in our lives from birth to grave. It's just, and it has to be there. And it should be there. This idea that stress is actually beneficial, that stress helps us, that stress is the thing that gives us grit, that moves us forward, that allows us to, to do challenging and complicated things. I'm more and more thinking, I don't mind the word stress, and I think it's, it's useful, obviously, there, but I think in a day-to-day -day basis, instead of trying to think stress, we should avoid stress, we just think I'm constantly in stress. It's just, where is that balance? And how can I get back to the balance better? And if I'm up here or down here, what can I do at both those stages to help me? Uh, I would say one thing, because we're going to, when we go into doing this, there are lots of great techniques out there. Lots of them. Because of the nature of my work, I'm interested in accessibility and capability. It's great if you've got enough time to do some exercises, but if you haven't, if it's in the moment or you're just busy, it's not accessible and therefore you know, can can we use it? So much of what I talk about is, is narrowing it down to easily accessible things that you can build on and capability. Uh, there are lots of great strategies there that I've been totally incapable of doing. I just, I, I don't know quite how I, need to focus so i have to do something else so what i try to do is to bring it down to things i think everyone could actually do and also that they can access that at pretty much every time so we'll, we'll talk a bit about that but how we can start to look at arousal and control it even high levels of arousal so the next time it happens actually we come out feeling a bit more relaxed and we feel relaxed quicker we can go on to the next slide now And this is what we're going to think about. Which side are you on? And this is a, a common research question. How do you think about stress? What does stress mean to you? And by getting the answers, you then measure how do we do it? So if you just click again, you'll, you'll find the common side of it. Please, Christoph. And these are kind of what we talked about. This is the, the sort of, it's kind of around a mindset base and a mindset and a mindset thinking. I don't go too much into that. Uh, I want to keep it simple and we're not really talking about a mindset webinar though we could uh, it's, but this is based on that idea uh, and it's, it's also very much based on the research that comes from this 
and the research, if you want to go and have a look at it, look at a thing called the social stress test, which is a, just a 10 minute talking in front of an audience test. It is so stressful for everybody, even experts in the field find it stressful. But it's also been shown if you change the way you think about what's happening, it actually changes the outcome of the stress, how people report back after it. It's still not a hugely pleasant experience because it's, it's meant to be stressful. And it's, it's not physically damaging, but it's a lot of pressure. But actually the research shows just reimagining what stress is, think of it in terms of arousal and using that changes the outcome about how we feel about it. And not only that, it prepares us for the next time. And we're going to talk about this a little bit about neural pathways, how we start to manage our neural pathways. So when we come up against challenging events, our mindset, our thought process is now enhanced that we don't have the particularly negative side that we think about the negative outcomes, rather negative stress and negative outcomes of high levels of arousal. And we'll talk a bit more about that. If you just click again, please, Christoph. And so this is how they put it, basically. That it enhances, enhances productivity. It improves health. Stress can improve health. It's quite strange because if we look at, I think Helen, I can't, I've forgotten how the quote was right at the beginning from the godfather of stress. Uh, it was, stress is bad. And that was done with animals. And it, it kind of kicked off the whole idea. Of, oh, look what happens. Look what happens when we put them under stress. Why are they physically responding really poorly to this? They actually changed that round and said, oh, that's how I now understand that stress exists. We need to learn how to control it and manage it rather than avoid it. But it definitely facilitates learning, facilitates growth, and it can be positive. But we have to start understanding how to manage it. Because I'm not here to say that stress is, is not damaging at, at all. You know, the evidence is solidly there that your physiology changes, your mental, emotional, and physical health changes when put under that level of pressure, especially constantly. It just happens. I'm more thinking about the reimagining. Can we kind of push that back a bit? Can we make ourselves more resilient, want a better word? But in at no time, I want to be quite clear. I was saying that all stress is good. We're going to be fine. We should, if that was the case, I wouldn't be talking about it. We just ignore it because we'd be doing great, but we're not. I just want to talk a bit more about the little things we can do to change that around along with the other things that other people are doing. So we go on to the next slide. Okay, this is primarily aimed, I mean, everyone should do this, but I'm going to talk to you as a humanitarian group. Uh, and I know that we have a wide range of everyone, very experienced uh, humanitarians, psychiatrists, but we also have students. This works for everybody, but I, I kind of wanted to come back to it. Uh, and I'm going to touch on lots of different little bits when we talk about this. But what I would say is understanding your purpose, understanding what's going, why you are doing something, define what your purpose is. And this does change. That's why the third one down says present purpose. But what is your purpose as a humanitarian? What is your purpose? And this, I'm, I'm doing some side work on trying to develop training for national staff because in the training I do, they don't get much of it. And that's, that sort of disparity annoys me is a, a weak word for it, but if I'm uncomfortable. And so I know from reading the research uh, and talking to people that if I'm a national staff and you know I think about what my purpose is, it could be as simple as it's a good job. It helps provide my family. My, my role is to provide for my family. So that's why I'm a humanitarian worker. For other people, it could be for me, I suppose East would put there. I woke up, uh, and of course, I've got my life behind me and my thought process, I think, but I, I can pretty much remember waking up and thinking, I'm at the point in my life now where actually I, I think I've got enough skills and I think I need to do something. So my purpose was actually to say, I've been very fortunate. My purpose is to go and actually try and help somebody else in a 
I worked for the NHS with you know, children that love, I wanted to do something else. So my purpose was really to get out there and try and hopefully share these skills. That was my purpose. Tune into your purpose. And that's so you can define it, but then really start to feel it. How does it make you feel? What do you do when you think about it? Where do you want to go with that? The emotional side of it, not just, well, oh, this is what I'd like to do, but how does that make you feel? What's that? What does that sort of dig into you? What does that touch you? Because that is important. That is the thing that will help you go through when things are difficult. And write down, write it down. Don't let it be an abstract thought. It certainly has to be a little paragraph of vignette. Write it down so you can look at it and come back to it. Because under pressure, it will be challenged, we will move. And there's, we could talk a bit now about moral injury and purpose and humility, but knowing and understanding that your purpose and importantly, the role you play in your organization. It's very easy to find the pressure of always having to do something and work harder and push up to just say, no, my purpose is to do this. This is what I want to do. A really good practice to keep you going is to journal this. And this is for humanitarians, it's for everyone but for humanitarians. This will keep you going when things are hard. And the best way to do it, again, it's not a big thing, it could be once every four or five days, you just sit down at the end of the day and you take five minutes and you think, what did I do today? And how are they in line with my values, my, my, my purpose, what I want to do? Just, to, and it doesn't have, you could feel you did nothing that day that was grand. You didn't change anything. You could put down, I took a step forward in doing what I want to do. I took a, oh, one moment, please. My, my little daughter's arrived back and I need to explain to her that I'm busy and I'm doing something. Can I just go, go in the bathroom? The other one, please, Ev. Like, oh, wait, I have, I have someone like here. Pink. And in the other bathroom, please. In the other bathroom, please. Go and tell mummy she'll help. I'm going to have to move her myself. I'm going to help. One minute, please. Okay, thank you. No, no, it's this way. I don't want to go in my bedroom upstairs. It's the life of um, working from home, I suppose. You know, this is not the BBC and some other channels that had uh, um, live um, recordings of events like that. So, um, but nevertheless, here we are again, Mark. You are mute. You, if you, I'm, I'm back to talking now. So this is a. We talk about controlling stress. I should use some of my techniques, but I prepared myself for understanding that a four-year-old will not be stopped and be quite inquisitive. Anyway, first, it can be something small, such as saying, today I got up and I went and I did my best. It doesn't matter if you think my best was not great or this. It's that you carried on moving forward. We'll talk a bit later. We'll come into the... What I will say is, if you do that, you are re you are actually changing your brain structure. You are changing your brain structure because you are creating neural pathways that recognise that even when things are difficult, you didn't get down about it. You thought, no, this is the, the this fills me with my purpose. This is what I do. I understand it. Be difficult. This has been shown to affect uh, issues like burnout. The small constant recognition of what you are doing creates neural pathways via dopamine uh, and that helps you go through the difficult parts as well as the good parts i would say it's even more important you do not want to wait three or six months for the great big end of your deployment and see how good it was it's too long as a human being we can't imagine how we feel in two weeks never mind two months every few days just keep creating that, that moving forward. It, be, it just works. All the research coming out now, looking at brain imagery, shows this happening. Here we go to the next one now. 
So here we are. These are just simple things to do, some little hints on this, the reimagining side. So threat. Heightened arousal is response effectively to threat. Again, whether it's a relationship issue, a deadline, or a checkpoint. Starting to understand threat as a challenge. And this, I'll, I'll say, this, this is a non-life threatening threat. You know, if someone's generally attacking you or someone's a, a, like an animal <laughs> towards you with this, that's dangerous and life-threatening. Then you go straight into the acute fight, flight, run, fight. You know, this is a sort of threat that you can perceive as a challenge that you can actually do something about in a more conceptual way. And it's the idea of using the arousal, uh, the energy that provides that you actually can think a bit clearer. You can be, oh, okay, I, I recognize my heart's racing. Well, that's because it prepared me for action. There's a, when people go into levels of high arousal, high stress, actually dopamine's released as well, because it's actually called a call to courage. It's one way of standing. We think of it as, oh, it's too frightening. Actually, humanitarians have a, a call to courage at high arousal. Walking towards what we perceive to be threatening, whether that's just going into an office or going into a hospital in Syria or a camp, it can be described as a call to courage. You'll get, your heart might be racing, you might be concerned worried. Reimagine it as, no, this is my body and mind preparing me to do my job, my purpose. This is what happens. And actually, it needs to happen because what I'm about to do is difficult. It's challenging emotionally, it's challenging mentally, and it can be challenging physically. So I need that arousal. What we need to do is to manage it. By doing that, and this is not overnight, I'm not here to tell you that if you walk into somewhere you find threatening and you think like this, it will be fantastic. It won't. It's a small, small step, incremental gains. You keep doing this, harness it to your purpose, and then it becomes more natural. And then you realize it's a call to courage. It's high arousal and a call to courage, and it has negative consequences if you don't manage it or look after it well. It will have some negative ones anyway. You will have sleepless nights. You may be physically ill, but you can get through those things. We're trying to lower the uh, response afterwards. So actually you don't take this with you. It dissipates quicker. The other thing, when you're feeling overwhelmed, and this is quite an interesting one. They study this is quite emerging. This comes from Stanford. Uh, when you're feeling overwhelmed and stressed, look around you. Ask if someone else wants a hand with a task. If it's just photocopying or picking up something to put it somewhere. And it's interesting this because if you're overwhelmed and can't think you can't do anything, two things happen. One, you look around and you help someone. The brain triggers this lovely response inside you that you are the sort of person that likes to help people. And it reinforces that part of your value. So you get that reward. It does the dopamine trick again because you've felt stressed, you've done something good, so therefore the cue and the outcome have changed, it's a good habit. What is also kind of fascinating is someone says thank you for doing that. Innately as a human being, when someone thanks you genuinely for doing something, you get a little flush of, and that reinforces your moral side, your value side and your purpose. Research has shown that even when you tell someone to do these little little things, say holding the door open for someone, even though they know they wouldn't hold the door open normally, say, and they have done so, that person thanks them and they think, well, I'm only doing this part of an experiment. The genuine thanks from that person's voice triggers something in our brain that overrides the fact that we can't, even though we know we've done it because we've been told to for an experiment, the genuineness overrides that and we feel good about ourselves. So that's one idea when you feel uh, overwhelmed do something just a small task they also distract you from what you're feeling overwhelmed about again this is only useful when it's not a direct physical threat that's going to cause you some heart, significant harm this is just a great thing that's a, i put that one in there particularly because it's a great thing to use in those hostile environments such as offices where we've got a deadline or someone's 
pushing us to do something, we can turn around and help someone else. On to the next slide. And this is what we're talking about. I'm already, this is as science as it gets. It started out quite sciencey, and then I thought, actually, it doesn't need to be that sciencey. People can look this up themselves, and I can give you the names of the people I look, look up, and, and you, they're very generous, these great neuroscientists who are just out there trying to make their clever lab science into things that we can use. Uh, but it helps create habits helps break bad habits by actually doing something different. It creates the plasticity of the brain, the neural pathways. It's not as good as when we're babies and we're super young, but we can do this and we can do that. So dopamine is what we're looking for. And it makes uh, environments less hostile. Dopamine suppresses cortisol. One of the reasons for a state of high arousal, you walk towards something, more dopamine is released. It's bringing down the stress hormones. We have to recognize that, that will help us. So. If you want to learn more about how all this, just start looking up dopamine. It's kind of thought of as a reward, but it's I think it's a bit more complex. Dopamine is the thing that makes you work through difficult things. It's the thing that makes, when you hear about people, how did they keep going to invent that? Why didn't they stop? And actually look at how they think dopamine is the, that's the pathway they were building. That's what they were using. And we can use it too. If you think, that sounds a bit too, would it work? This is why Facebook, Twitter, Instagram are so big. Facebook, the user, oh, was it, what's it, it was just user experience, CEO, whatever, a few months ago apologized, said, I feel incredibly guilty about what we've done because they use the concept of the dopamine pathways and how to get people to want to see what was going on. So people went back and back and back and kicked into it. This is what they use to do that. We can use it as well in a small way to do what we, we want to do. This is, I think it's, it's uh, I think yeah, Facebook, when you put something down or Twitter, they don't give you all your likes at once. They work out the patterns of how often you look at it and then they might give you one and then make you wait five minutes to give you three and then wait 20 minutes but give you 10 and it keeps, and this actually, that Q reward, Q reward, it's why you keep on going back to it. So here's the thing, turn your phones off at night. <laughs> that will really help you. On to the next slide, please. We're going to go, because I, I keep an eye on the time as well. I can just see it ticking slowly down there and I want to touch on some things. So I want to give you some strategies now. Finish off with some ideas about what I think are really accessible uh, and work really well and why they work. And we know lots about deep breathing uh, and its benefits. When I think of it, I want to think of things where we have to, we're at the door to go in to have a difficult conversation or hear a difficult story where you're, you're approaching a checkpoint and you've done your security training, but it's still quite nerve wracking because who knows what's going to happen? And so lots of people know the deep breathing. And so it, it does this. This is a, a shortcut, as it were. And I explain a bit about how it works uh, because we talk about another form of breathing, which you'll know about. But the, the thing to do is you take a big, big breath. So if you sort of feel your lungs filling up. When you think, you can't take any more, hold it, and you take another little bit of a fill through your nose and do that three or four times. And what's happening is it's, it's that sort of thing that you see when people cry, for instance. When people do it in their sleep where it's that, <laughs> and they're taking another one. What it's actually doing is it's triggering the vagus nerve, which works on the diaphragm, which is a wonderful thing, which you'll all know about people who meditate and stuff like that. We can't control our heart rate. That's not working. We're not, let's say, have some adrenaline. Diaphragm, though, oh, we're good to go with that. We can control that. The trick to this, the thoughts coming from this, is this is coming, from, this is coming straight from the emergency side of uh, one of the labs in Stanford, is it's actually about controlling the CO2. That second one pushes the air sacs more open and it gets rid of CO2 and your CO2 levels and your state of arousal, ergo stress, but state of arousal are closely linked. 
It's one way people look at seeing how aroused or stress people are is to measure their CO2. So this is just a quick way of clearing out, just a physically quick way of clearing out CO2. That extra one pushes the air sacs up a little bit and pushes out the CO2. And so you're getting rid of CO2 quickly. And if you're doing that, it's a bit of a sign to the rest of the system. Oh, OK, it's relaxing time. The other clever little thing about it is once you start doing this, you are now telling yourself, I'm about to do something. I'm taking a deep breath. You add that to it's a challenging situation, rather than a threatening situation, because you're doing all these little things, they start to become automatic. And all of a sudden, you start to build up a backlog of times that you did simple little things, you took control of what you could, and you came out of it okay. And then you reflect on it. Well, but that, <clears throat> and I know the lab has been doing loads of different experiments about which is the best way to do this. And the latest they've come out with is this. It did, I think it started out as two big breaths through your nose and then one short one, but they actually worked out that this is just quicker. And that's what it is. It's about being accessible. This works. And I set up all the things that I've started to do this is the one that I kind of like the most because it's just like that. But that's the base of it. It just works on a physical effect that actually changes your arousal levels quite quickly. Again, I don't want to stop your, your arousal levels. If you're going to checkpoint or you're going to listen to a difficult story or you're going to have to have that challenging conversation, what we talked about, how it enhances us, that has to be there. I want those arousal levels to be there. What I want to do is to manage them so they don't overwhelm you. I want you to learn that just by doing simple techniques, you can control this. And then those little neural pathways grow and it becomes more normal. And my hope is, and this is where it becomes more hopeful than knowledge, because I don't know the research in this, because it's emerging. These things that look after you through your deployment will hopefully stop the long drawn out tale of clinical issues like depression, anxiety, because you will come out of there not having experienced things that have been difficult, but having more of an understanding and control of that. And that's my hope for that side of it. I've sent my thoughts off on this and I'm waiting a response uh, to the lab saying, would this work for humanitarians if they did this in this situation? So hopefully they might come back and say, that's, that's pretty interesting. We'll look at it. If we go on to the next slide now, please. So here we are again, box breathing. And we all know about box breathing. There's lots of different ways to do it. <clears throat> I'm going to come up at it this way. And the reason I'm coming at it this way is because you want to see people who are good at remaining calm. Uh, you want to look at people who do things like free diving, who go deep, deep underwater. Because as someone said, it's actually not the, the lack of oxygen that's really painful. It's the too much CO2. That's what causes this, the high anxiety. It's not, I haven't got enough oxygen. It's got, I've got too much CO2. That's why you take taking more oxygen to get rid of the CO2 because it's creating a stress response, a high arousal. So everyone does box breathing, the in for four, out for four, or you get different patterns. Uh, actually, the way you breathe in and out kind of changes. So you can go to arousal and down. And there's some very clever ones where you do lots of fast breathing to bring your arousal rate up and you practice that. Again, I want to talk about something you can take away. You can do anywhere at any time, sat in your office before or after a sort of a challenging time. And this is about managing your CO2 tolerance. And the really simple way to do it is you just time it. You take three normal breaths through your nose just very normal and then one super deep one get your little phone out or if you've got a fancy old stopwatch and you've got your stopwatch on and you just slow 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 as you can and you time it that's all you're doing you're timing it if you stop if you go and stop that's your stop. Not, oh, I didn't mean to stop. If you pause, that's your stop. You can do it again and again. Don't worry. It's not, it's not a test. Normal people, 
in a normal level of CO2, not to stress at any time, between 30 and 60 seconds. That's how long it should take. That's your CO2 tolerance. And it will change week to week. If I did mine now, it would not be as good as it was two hours ago or in two hours time because I'm doing this and I'm talking a lot and breathing and I'm like thinking a lot. If you're doing that, just do the box breathing. Do it five, five, five. Five in, five hold, five out. I've hold. You can do it through your nose, that's better. Through your mouth is as good as well. Some people have things with their nose and they don't breathe well through it, so don't worry. If it's lower than 30 seconds, you're just at a time where your tolerance isn't that great. Do sets of three. If it's above 60 seconds, sets of seven. If it's above 60 seconds, you are in fine physical shape because this is sort of the athlete's level of CO2 tolerance. But even theirs will change. So that's the two things, the physiological side, the breathing, and this, box breathing. There are lots of other ways, but I just want to give you something simple and explain why it works and why it's good just to keep doing that. Every two weeks, I'd recommend for, for, for testing it. Once you set it, just do it. And do this anytime you want. We'll go on to the next slide now. I've got a little bit of time. We're going to talk a bit about sleep and we're going to bring them all together. Uh, everything we do is now, I'm going to think of, comes through our eyes. Uh, and the uh, part of our eyes is actually part of our brain. It's not a separate thing that's connected by nerves. It's actually part of our brain, the neural retina. This is getting a bit beyond where I am, but it's very linked into how the people think about breathing and threat and stuff like that really important because it tells us about our body clock and how we wake up and go to sleep. And we know that if people want to say, how can I improve your life to anyone, not just humanitarians, but anyone, I'd like to be a bit more alert and calm uh, and I'd like to sleep better. Eyes are really good and vitally important to doing that. And I'll, I'll explain a bit more if you jump through to the next slide, please, Christopher. Christopher. It's about rhythms. It's about how we activate our body clock. It's, and where we sort of genetically, we've been going for a fair while now. And our bodies change very slowly because they're pretty good at what they do. So this is this is just a very simple task. Again, you can do this anywhere. This doesn't require special training or anything. What I'm going to suggest is do the breathing. If you want to do the breathing exercises, do them when you do this. It enhances everything. Sunlight, sunset. And again, with the phone, if you want to have a little test of this, you can get a light meter as if you were using a camera. And you can watch and measure the difference. Sunlight around sunset and sunrise. And it's different. Do it outside. We're very sensitive. To, even through glass, we're sensitive to that. If you go outside, two minutes, to 10 minutes that's it doesn't have to be great don't have to be oh i want sunrise and sunset that's beautiful i'd actually suggest waiting until the sun's up to give it an hour or two but try and manage it what happens is the yellow blue light balance and things like that regulate uh uh let's get this right now a dopamine so we go out in the morning it starts to go oh, this is the sort of light that means I'm waking up and should be more alert, and it changes the sort of hormonal balance. It regulates that system. Going out at night, oh, sorry, just before sunset, the change in light tells our brain again, oh, that change in light means it's going down. This is time I go to sleep. So if you're going outside, you're doing the box breathing, and you're doing it at this time. This is not magical this is not like a unfortunately it's not like a headache tablet you know i've got a headache i take the tablet i feel better half an hour later this is just part of a small little thing that you can do this came straight from the huberman lab and this is what they're working with and he was basically saying, this is the thing he talked a bit about blue lights so i put that in there because everyone's sort of guilty of looking at their phones and the computers actually the the key time not between 11 o'clock at night and four in the morning that will throw your hormones out the window because of the difference in the sort of light. I mean, also, you know, really, you should be trying to get to sleep around that time. So 
these things, put, the trick I do with them is I put them where I have to actually get out of bed because I'm naturally lazy and I don't like to do it. And I put it somewhere else. So if it does beep, I can't bother answering it. I do have a different sounding beep for messages that I have to answer because of my work, but I don't have it next to the bed because I just hear a beep and I wake up and I look at it and bang. That's my brain has suddenly started to, even if I fall back to sleep, it's changed something. So these are simple things. I mean, that's 11 o'clock till four in the morning. I think we can manage that. And this is what I want to do, bring it down to that. Uh, if we go to the next slide, so I'm quickly looking at the time and I do want to get down. This is it. In the exercise, if you can, and I could do this, and I was thinking about times when I've been constrained with where I am, places in, in Kabul and in Iraq and places. Outside, don't look at your phone. No matter how relaxed you might find it, this is narrow vision. And narrow vision is when we're focusing on something. And so it has that slight arousal mismatch. You do a thing called panoramic. Uh, and it's, it's as simple as this. Look at something in front of you. Now try and take in everything without moving your head. So you just look ahead. Now try and see the sides. What happens is your eyes open slightly, you'll feel them. Panoramic. Once we're looking at things around us, it sends a signal to our brain that nothing's there. But not this. We're with this it's a much more relaxed system just another little thing these are constant little things that have a physiological change which i'm interested in if you can walk around spend that you've done your three two three minutes of breathing you want it's nice a bit of walking around this thing called optic flow the way that if something's coming towards us and it's getting faster, and it's a lion, <laughs> our arousal rates go up, fight or flight time. Strangely, it's shown EMDR is kind of like this. If you're moving towards something, just gently, and you've got that big wide vision, our brain registers things going past. It also tells us that we're moving towards things, and we're aware, but we're not under threat, optic flow, uh, which I had to admit, until six months ago, I'd never heard of. So I'm just following the research as it's coming out. But... I was cycling yesterday, gently, nothing too much, just enjoying the day. And I thought, this, I get this. That gentle process of moving through space and time, things going like this. This is, and I thought, this is why I like cycling. Not the mountain biking crashing downhill, which is nerve wracking, just the gentle cycling along a promenade next to the sea or down a country lane. It clicked. Just another small thing. Uh, Jump to the next slide, please, Christoph. I'm noticing we're coming down, so I'm going to go through this. Simple thing to do, link to your purpose, matching your rewards to efforts. When I talked about don't wait till the end of the deployment to say, didn't we do a great job? It's too far away. You have a lot to go through. That bit of stopping and saying, actually, today was okay. I didn't achieve this, but I went in and tried, and that's all I need. Or it might be to the team that you're working with. We did well then. Yeah, we got where we needed to be today. That was good. It doesn't have to be a big speech, just that knowledge. It's a simple thing to show on this thing about marathon runners. They'll tell you, how do you run a marathon? What's the first step? Put the shoes, but trainers, sneakers by the door. Next day, get up, put them on, go out. Next day, run an extra half a mile. Build up like that. That's not the secret. That's the physical way you do it. The secret is recognizing I put the shoes by the door. My purpose is to run a marathon. Not I'm running 26 miles because you ain't going to do it and you'll feel bad. The door. Next time you put them on, you go out for a run. I put the shoes on. I'm moving forward. My purpose. That's all it is. And it amplifies the system. The dopamine is clicking in. I did this. It did this. I feel better. Reward, Q, stimulus, Q, reward, stimulus, Q, reward, stimulus, Q, reward. Much the same as <laughs> I'm from the UK, as you probably guessed. Talk to people in the UK after a hard day at the office. Oh, I'm going to have a glass of wine. It's a very common thing. Actually, if you think about it, why? Why wine? Is there other things you like to drink and taste more? Why not them? It's because we've, we've got the Q, stress, stimulus, wine's what I do. This is one of the hardest habits to break. And I have friends who work in the field and they say it is really difficult. 
but that's all we're doing. This will help with things like burnout and distress and stuff like that. It's not perfect. Nothing is, if there was something perfect, I'd have written a book. Helen would be promoting it to everybody. <laughs> what we have is lots of little things and that's what we should be aiming at. Uh, go to the next one. I think we're pretty much coming towards the end now. We are at the end. We've managed to get through and tell you the things to do. Tetris. I put this in because it's fascinating. Uh, and this is a sort of, I just like it. That's what I put it there. This is just a more high end thing, but it's coming out with a big piece of research all over now. But it started at Oxford and this journalist told me about. And it's about dealing with actual difficult memories. And it started out with post traumatic stress disorder and really big memories. But now they're looking at, at doing that. And go and read more about it because to go into it is, is I'd need a whole thing here. But it's fascinating how doing something so simple as playing the game of Tetris can reorganize how we store distressful memories and that the evidence is flying out that it actually is lowering those symptoms. And I just really like it that we don't, well, in some ways I'm kind of challenged after all the money I've spent on trying to educate myself and do so, that Tetris is better than me at this. But I like to put it there. Definitely go and read it and you'll see it. And it's beautiful. It's about how they play it within six hours. You play it for 10 minutes and you do it before you go to sleep. And it's just that. It's accessible. Everyone's capable of playing Tetris. You don't even have to play it well. You just have to do it. And the way it affects how we store memories. There are other ones as well, but I kind of like the Tetris one because I like Tetris. But that's my final slide. And that was kind of to back up everything else to say we don't have to overcomplicate this. Oh, uh, six, within six, I'll just see that question. Six, uh, <laughs> six hours of what? I'll go back and around now. So what they would do would be, if I remember correctly, the first group, because that's when I, I sort of picked it up. Uh, they get people to go through the event or part of the event, because people can have layers of difficult events, but the event, the memory. Uh, and, and, and they thought about it to go through it. Uh, and then within six hours of that, this is the, and there's lots of studies now that have moved it around for different people, six hours of going through the memory, of reactivating the memory, play the game. And the best way someone started to me was said, it's just kind of like, you think about it, it's stuck there, and I think it's short term, long term. Uh, and then you do this, and the act of playing Tetris and the, the way it is, where it's a block style and a thinking game activates the brain, and actually, gets rid of the bouchon, it pushes, pushes the cork through. It doesn't get rid of the memory, but it actually pushes it into, into an, a state where it should say, and reduces the symptoms. It's, it's, it's more complicated than that. <laughs> it's complicated. Uh, but basically that's it. Yeah, six, six, within six hours, this is the last bit I read, it might have changed now because it's, it's quite new. Uh, within six hours of going through the memory and people depending how they do it will have people just doing themselves thinking about it on a, on a self-directed way or sitting with a, a counselor or someone who's trained talking about it and then going through that uh, but definitely look that one up that's the end of it for me i'm leaving it on tetris tetris is the answer to everything <laughs> uh, i think we go now to a q a okay so I'll, I'll leave Christoph or Helen to explain the rest. But thank you all for listening. Thank you for putting everything down in the chat. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for that uh, interesting insight. Um, some some different facts. Uh, you know, I think it's it's uh, it, it's an interesting and inspiring um, idea to kind of reframe the idea of stress. You know, and May to look at. May I suggest yeah. just to have uh, maybe two minutes break because we know that, you know, after one hour, uh, yeah. I think it would be good for everyone just to have, you know, one, two minutes to have a, uh, to breathe, to have a glass of water. So guys, uh, I invite Stand you to up, take a little uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. stretch. Yes. Do some breathing. <laughs> and um, yes, and uh, we'll come back. Um, yes, in, in, in two minutes, if it's okay for everyone. Be fine. That'd be perfect. Thank you. I'll, I can just go calm my daughter down <laughs> okay see you right. thank you minutes. thank you helen for this yes hello i'm back welcome back everyone <laughs> okay.
Okay. The mark is fascinating. Huh? Wow. I'm really impressed. <laughs> Okay, guys, now we are in the second part of this webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask um, Mark. Don't and be shy. You also have the chat box, <laughs> so you can go ahead. Uh, what I'd like to say is uh, if you want to, people want to think within how they feel comfortable uh, that, oh, I experienced this when I was there, or this is happening, or how does that and it can relate to an actual incident or how they are. What would you think about this or how would that help them? I'm happy to sort of broaden my, my experience and hopefully they don't just have to really narrow it down on this. They can sort of think broader with them. And I'll try and see if I've got any ideas for that, but I'll do my best. <laughs> Mark, I just have the same question like Stephanie. Uh, can you explain or might be show us what is this uh, box breathing? Uh, it's not so clear for me. <laughs> Okay, that's that's yeah, it's absolutely perfect. So box breathing, uh, and there's it's called box because it's this is quite nice when you uh, back to the old days of having a big whiteboard in front of you because it goes in a box. Just to think about it as going in a box. Uh, so it's a, a process. So a, a, a tip would uh, be to take couple of deep breaths before you start just open your lungs up but then you could go and you can do this mouth or nose it's it doesn't make that much difference as this concept of what happens in your nose the, the nerve endings there but if you have a blocked nose or something don't worry so i'll just do it through my mouth just because it's the easiest one and that's what people can access so you just go for me i would i'll start so you want to know about how you make work your co2 tolerance Okay, I'll, I'll actually just show you by doing this. I won't do the whole thing because you don't have to go through the whole thing, but I'll go on to stopwatch. There we are, stopwatch. And so I've got my stopwatch up and I would go, I, I would just be like, okay, I just want to go. And on this one, I'll breathe in and then I breathe out slowly through my nose and start to stop. So I go. And then when my lungs are empty, I just stop and look at it. And whatever time I have on there, that's my what is called the CO2 tolerance. That is how much I can express from some deep breaths through my nose and in what time. And the mm. CO2 tolerance just tells me by working out, is it below 30 seconds? Is it above 60 seconds? Where I am in my arousal state? Because CO2 is closely linked to measuring our stress state. Uh, so if, I'm, if I've done that and I 25 seconds, I would be thinking, okay, I'm, I'm quite high arousal. Mine would probably be low 30 seconds because I'm doing this. Uh, and also my breathing is out of pattern with that. Uh, I would think, okay, my box breathing, the in for four, hold for four, out for four, hold for four, would be three. Three seconds, three seconds, three seconds, three seconds. Between 30 and 60 seconds, five is good. Five seconds, five seconds, five seconds, five seconds. More than 60 seconds on my timed exhale would be do it for seven seconds. If you look up box breathing, you'll see lots of changes in do I do seven seconds hold, five seconds out. This is a very simple way because you don't have to hold the numbers. So I've done that. I'm at 25 seconds. So my, my box breathing would be this, and I'll, I'll demonstrate this, which would be...
Very simple. Breathe in for three seconds, hold for three seconds, breathe out for three seconds, hold for three seconds, repeat. And you can repeat that four, three, four times. This is the beginning of when people get into much more meditative stuff, where they start to do the breathing, and then you can get some, you can do this with some more body relaxation, where you could lie down and clench one fist, clench another, and do, or you can go online onto Google, and you will get, you download a little MP3 where people will guide you through it. I did it, one I did before I read about this, uh, was very simple. It was the same thing. I just did it for five seconds randomly. Uh, but I had someone on headphones just talking through, breathing, hold, clench, one fist. So there's lots of ways out there. And it's, if you're doing some nice controlled breathing, pretty much not a wrong way to do it. I'm not saying this is that and they're all wrong. What I'm saying is, this is why this is good because of CO2 tolerance. This is why I like it because instead of being four seconds here or seven seconds there or whatever, it's very simple and you can measure it. So the state you're in means you can change it. So one day you might be stressed and thinking, I'm a seven second box breather, I can do that. And suddenly you find out <laughs> it's really stressful. You think, no. I'll just test myself again. Oh, of course, I've just had a deadline and worked hard in this in the field for two weeks. No wonder my CO2 is not great. I need to just give myself a break. So that's why I like it, because it adapts with you and the state that you're in and where you are. So I hope that so, people understood that. Yeah, yeah, Mark, I mean, I, it, it makes sense to me that, okay, breathing has an influence on, on your body and how you feel stressed. Yeah. The thing which I don't catch on is what, what's the CO2 tolerance thing? How does that, what does okay. that mean? Uh, and this is, this is, this is the, the clever science bit. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I said, emerging with myself. Well, it's based on the, on the which, and the, the, the old science is old. Yes, it's, it's not like a hundred years. It's not real science. It's psych science. It's new. Uh, it's by measuring CO2, the amount of CO2 in our systems, it's closely linked with our state of arousal and so you'll see a lot of studies if you look at it if you put in co2 and stress you'll get a lot of research papers and there's some uh there's some particular ways of doing research which i don't know about because it's not that's not part of what i'm interested in and what i do i was, I was interested that oh the uh oh someone's put the wim hof in yes uh it's uh i was interested in the fact that as we know, our state of stress or arousal, high in arousal, is closely linked with the CO2. And releasing CO2, flushing CO2 out of our body, uh, is linked with lowering her arousal, just on an automatic level. So this is an automatic thing. We open those sacs, we get more oxygen, we put more CO2 out. It tells our body, oh, we should move from sympathetic parasympathetic systems. We need to go back to rest and digest. Very small way. Uh, and so what I was interested in was, one, how can we do that quickly? Uh, and the Hoogman lab showed that actually the quickest way to do it is the, the physiological sigh, that sort of thing you see people when they're crying and relaxing. Crying is a massive way, by the way. Tears affect the cortisol, the hormones released when we cry affects it. And, so, and that's why that breathing comes in as well. Uh, I was interested in how we do that efficiently and how could we do it in a way that humanitarians in particular could use because they have a number of situations such as checkpoints where you can't suddenly just go, this is going to be challenging, Mr. Checkpoint, so I'm going to just hang on, don't ask me a question, I'm just going to close my eyes and spend five minutes doing some deep breathing and thinking to myself. Now that'd be great if you could, but quite often we can't. So I wanted something that did that quickly. I'm not saying it does that's better than other things, but I am saying it's probably the easiest and most accessible way to do it. And so doing that. And the extension of that, the box breathing, uh, which I've done a lot. And then when I read that, I was like, oh, it's fascinating that instead of me just having to follow a pattern, they've now worked out a way of measuring our CO2 tolerance uh, at any particular time Quite simply, you know, probably better if you could put something in your mouth and breathe it out into a tube and measure it. But this is, you know, what we are where we are. So I was interested in that. Yeah, so the concept is CO2 in our bloodstream 
is closely linked to our state of arousal. Flushing out CO2 changes our state of arousal because it tells our auto autonomous system that we're moving from fight and flight to rest and digest. In fact, breathing on the whole is doing that. That's one of the reasons why it's really good to do because it, it's like a little switch where you go, oh, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this. You start breathing and it's almost like you're telling your brain, oh, I should be going into fight or flight, but Mark's not doing what I want to do. His deep breathing means my heart rate can't pump the adrenaline around. You can't have slow, deep breaths and a pumping heart rate. You, know, you, can't, you can't do it. We can't make our hearts go faster now. But if they're fast, we all know that after we've had to run up some stairs or for a bus, <laughs> we're like, that's the first thing we're doing. So these, these are why I'm sort of interested in that. It's that little thing. That it, the more we practice, the more it starts to give us also a sense of control in an, a situation which we feel inherently out of control. We can't control it. But by doing that, it starts to remind us, oh, no, I can't control what the checkpoint is happening. I can't control how that person's going to react when I have to give them some bad news. I can control myself. I can start to help myself. And actually, the more I do it, I'm getting a nice, quicker signal. This is what I do when I'm actually taking control. And that's not yeah. perfect, but it, it fits into the enhancing rather than debilitating idea of stress. I hope that helps. Yeah, Emily, you had this question. I hope that clarifies it a little bit on how that links with the managing stress. Cool. Yay. <laughs> any, <laughs> any other question, anyone? Mark, if I can just, uh, yeah. oh, sorry, Anthony, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Um, Hi, Des. How are you doing, Mark? Um, you mentioned just at the outset about the whole R&R &R cycle thing. Then your last slide kind of mentioned it, but I wasn't too sure if you could just kind of go into that a bit more in terms of what you were saying that depression and PTSD, anxiety, et cetera, is slow <laughs> to dissipate post a Yes. R&R, &R, I mean, my experience of R&R &R is I have to get more stressed doing R&R &R, because I know yeah. that a billion emails waiting for me when I get back. So, um, but in terms of the whole, yeah, way to uh, manage uh, or even mitigate best the whole anxiety and PTSD or, uh, yeah, if you've been through a major incident, what, you know, what tips would you give organisations? Okay. Okay. Uh... I'll split, I'll split because you, you, you've covered a lot there. <laughs> so I'm going to go. And, and you mentioned at the end you've been through an incident. And how we deal with that, I think, is different than the go to R&R. &R. So I'll deal with the incident bit first because it'll be shorter. <laughs> and then I'll come to the, the longer term thing. Uh, I would suggest any organisation, uh, when there's been something, and the easy way to think about this is I have my own ideas of critical incidents. Uh, but I, I think a seriously shocking event is a nice way to understand it. Seriously shocking, because we can understand that. Would it seriously shock a average person? Uh, and I, I know it's because I've dealt with things from car bombs, uh, the, the aftermath of that, uh, to people who've had a, witnessed a heart attack in their office in a very normal environment. And the effects were the same. The post-traumatic stress reactions were the same because both are distressing. There's slight differences. Well, differences of any sort of terror attack is it becomes more personal. So a heart attack can be, well, you know, it's part of life, I guess, and health. A terror attack is even when you know they weren't after Mark Bradley, the brain recognises someone went out of their way to harm someone near you. Ergo, that's you. We, do, we stop differentiating at that point. So terror is slightly different. The way to deal with it, I think, is on an organisation level, to, to as that happens, first thing is to make people aware that something's happened. So it doesn't just stay where they are. So say it happens in, and I'm just going to use this because I've worked there, in Afghanistan. And the head office is in, I'm going to say, London, because it makes it easy for me to think in those terms. The first thing is, whoever's in Afghanistan, someone needs to go to London and say, this has happened. No one was physically hurt but we had some witnesses or 
they have friends in the community, particularly national staff who live and work in a place where this is going on. This has happened. We need to make you aware and we're now going to monitor it. So that's the first thing. So people know that we're not ignoring this, that we're getting fatigued about the fact that it's happening. And then you monitor it. And I've, I've, I've been at a car, a uh, couple of other particular, it's nice one to think about after a car bomb incident. Uh, and they were actually okay. I, I spent two days with the guys who were involved and they knew the people, one person that died, a photographer, and they're okay because their resilience was quite high. So I wasn't looking for that. I was looking for natural levels of distress, normal uh, reactions after an abnormal event. But two days later, they were, yeah, we kind of get it. It's awful. But this is, this is our life. We understand that. Importantly, the organisation, I would say back in London or wherever, they can't go, that was awful. Look what's happened. Then 24 hours later, because their lives are very different, they come back to the office and go, I feel better. I bet they feel a bit better too. Because this happens. And it's not that they're being horrible. It's because they're distant. And so the shock wears off much quicker. And so they, it's about people, the organisers saying, OK, we need now, we've been made aware, in 72 hours, let's check in. 72 hours after that, we check in again, knowing that there's a, a pathway back that at any time they can get into and say, look, this isn't good. A couple of our colleagues are really suffering. They said they're not sleeping well. When we need to up our support and I would suggest in that case good psychosocial support is the first thing this is not about counseling or psychotherapy or anything like that it's good psychosocial support the listening the talking psychological first aid I mean in, in my world I would have a trained psychological first aid person in every group or team and you could do that online it doesn't have to be expected in fact here's a little tip to everybody just go on to Corsa go on to the John Hopkins site they do a brilliant self-directed online psychological first aid, which you can do in your own time. And then you can get a certificate, which you pay for, or you can just screen grab it because they'll give you the certificate on there. Everyone should do that. So that'd be my, that'd be how I would address this. And the other thing you talked about, about going into R&R and &R, <laughs> it not working, or as I think quite often, right, that's finished. I'm back at home. I can't relax. I'm finding everything stressful. Actually, I'm being quite argumentative with friends and family. I find it hard to adjust to come down. I think that's different. Uh, my advice for that is, <laughs> this is good, I'm going to go my pet idea about what things to happen. I think there should be a duty of care for debriefing. Anyone comes out of a, an environment that has been, that they, you know before they go there, they should be debriefed. And how you manage that debriefing is interesting but it shouldn't just be a one-off you should touch base with the person afterwards i would as go as far as to say that if as an organization you send someone into an environment that you know is likely to create high levels of arousal stress possible we now know that anxiety depression clinical things like that are, are higher and you know that even if that person leaves your organization you should have something in place to help support them now, what that is and how that works is, we can think about that. I mean, I, I do know what that is and how that should work, or I think I do, but that should be there. And here's the why. Because at the end of it, knowing that support is there is like everything in life. If you know someone's going to catch you if you fall, you stay standing a bit longer. You go forward a bit more. Okay, I'll get through today, then I'll do that abandoning people by going right you're gone off you go that's it you did your job we're going to talk about you particularly you know you might be troublesome because you're feeling quite ill it doesn't help them and it, 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 you know, it doesn't create this organizational care it, it, it propagates the problem it'd be interesting now you've told me that i'm going to go back and have a look at this I'm, and wonder if there's a link between the level of dissipation of emotional distress etc and the support offered by the organization i'm going to suggest the better the support, the quicker it dissipates. And the problem that it, it, it lasts longer is not because, and this I know this is not true, it's not because humanitarians are inherently more vulnerable to anxiety, stress and weakness. It's because they're left alone without the support. And that's what the, that's what the issue is. It's not about the fact that they can't cope. It's about the fact they need more help because they've been in a place that anyone would find difficult to cope. 
how do we stop that? <laughs> the things I've been talking about, out of all of them, the breathing's great, the going outside's great. The, the, the one thing I would suggest is, and I know that the students with co-create and I'm, I'm universities talk about this and I might be across in Geneva with the other son with the university talking to them about some of their students the purpose why you're doing something what it is you're doing what it means to you doing that and then doing the journal tying back to that recognizing that you're not getting lost in all this distress and that you're actually there for and it's difficult and it's challenging but that's what you're there for that coming back that to regularly do that and that's why i like the journal adding in that those small little rewards of today i got up and did a difficult thing because i my byword when i do the uh, hostile environment enhanced courses where we do this to people now is humility and one thing i've learned for myself <laughs> is humility by understanding that you might go somewhere spend three six months a year and leave and the situation is worse than when you arrived because you arrive there thinking i'm going to change it's going to be better you're setting yourself up for a difficult task if you think i'm going to go there because this is these are my values and i'm going to try my best and that's all i can do and if i leave that's what i want to leave with knowing through the ups and downs i kept on trying that will protect you for, and things like moral injury that will help you with that because you're going to come up against that so that's what i would say with that purpose there should be a whole pre-deployment <laughs> session on purpose write down your purpose think about your values here's your little journal book do it do it do it and of course you could reflect on that you get to your r and r that was a hard month let's look back at the journal you know that was hard but we did all these things and i understand about arousing the call to courage and moving forward I can go on my R&R &R now because I've been thinking and reflecting on this throughout. This is not, I've held on, I've held on, I've held on. <sighs> right, I've got 48 hours off. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to go to bed. I'm not going to sleep well. I'm not going to be able to stop thinking about the fact I have to go back <laughs> to somewhere. That's like quite difficult. So that's it. But it's, it's such an organisational thing. It's unfair, I think, to ask the individual just to do that themselves. Yeah. yeah. That's just right. too hard. Yeah. 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 Mark, yeah, there we I go. Want to, I just want to quickly read a comment here that's been uh, posted by Caitlin. Um, I think uh -huh. what's Hi, did Caitlin. you see it? Did you see it? Huh? I've just I seen know. it, but I know Caitlin from. I Chatham. think what's really pertinent is more and more results are showing that there are longer term impact of poor mental health on aid workers. So a debrief is kind of useless. You're still pumped with adrenaline. <laughs> and you don't have time to look back and see what happened and how you felt also ptsd symptoms can take longer than two weeks post mission to show up so i agree mark duty of care should extend at least six months post mission if not longer okay th thank you caitlin <laughs> for challenging me on all those things uh Kate has got some great stuff, and I have to admit, I've, I've read the stuff she does, and I love it. It's informing the work that I'm doing on the side about organisational stuff. Uh, I'll go to the easiest bit at the, the end. Uh, I, in, in the piece I'm writing for organisations, it's uh, post-employment. Even if you leave the organisation, there should be a level of support for six months. That was the, the exact amount I put six months. And if you're still within the organization, it should just be ongoing. It should, it should not be, oh, you've been there. It should just be ongoing. Because I think this case, I, I, the worst case of post-traumatic stress disorder I ever had to help deal with was 22 years after the event. And that person had led a normal life, had a job, family brought up, that I, and it was like that, 22 years. So I, I agree exactly, but I think at least six months after you've left an organization, support should be available. And I know there's cost issues in that, but I also know how you can do that without that being excessive. Uh, mental just health. One, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one more question to put further down here. Uh, I know you have a background and interest in positive psychology as well, Mark. Do you have yes. suggestions of additional interventions that you believe can be helpful for aid workers? 
I'm going, to, I'm going to come to that because that's that's one thing and we touched on that, but I'm actually going to ask thing about the debriefing thing as well, the pump for the adrenaline. Yeah. Okay. That's Go why on. I specifically said about uh, with Des, 72 hours, after 72 hours, because, yeah, I mean, psychological first aid, great straight after an event and this lot, but, I and I use the word debriefing, actually, it's, I just use it a random word because there's lots of different ways of doing it. I think psych, uh, sort of, I agree with that. Why the adrenaline's flowing through you and has dissipated, very difficult, very scattered. After two hours, that's the time I think you should start some sort of psychosocial support. And that is really, and I start at the basic level of not clever counselling or anything like that. That is really at the level of a conversation, of an understanding and listening process. So, yeah, I kind of agree with everything Caitlin said there. I just wanted to clear up what I meant about the debriefing side. But I'll go on to her uh, positive psychology uh, bit. I've, it's more, for me, it's more of a, an interest. I like it in techniques. And I've, I've looked into it because I've got a particular interest in shame. And hence, I, I touch on more uh, moral injury every now and again. But that's a whole other webinar. Uh, and, uh, the, the, and I think concept, and I've touched on that, when I talked about that uh, being overwhelmed to being, it said hopeful, remember, it should say helpful doing that. And that's based loosely, but kind of around the idea of, of gratitude, small acts of kindness. Well, sorry, sorry kindness, I'll talk about gratitude in a minute. Small acts of uh, kindness, random acts of kindness. Just, I feel overwhelmed. <sighs> okay, I can deal with this. I'm going to look around now and try and help. And that's linked into that small acts of kindness and the, and the the way that that reflects on us when someone says thank you uh, in a in a genuine manner. Uh, so I, I, that's one thing I do is is don't just focus on what you perceive your role to be as. For me, well, I'm a psychologist. That's what I do when I'm on I'm, I'm on deployment. I'm going to do that. You think that's what I do, but I'm also a human being, and to protect those bits of me that are away from that. I need to help with the team and do little things. And that can just be as simple as saying, does anyone, would anyone like some water? And everyone does this, I'm going to make some coffee. Who'd like some coffee? Let me get that. Or someone's really busy, I'm going to wash everyone's cups up because they've all been left there that busy. Small, random acts that are achievable that we can do. If we're waiting to do a big grand gesture, we could be waiting for a long time. It might never come. <laughs> Much better we do the small ones. So for positive psychology, Definitely be looking at uh, small acts of kindness. Gratitude. Uh, I like the values journal because it fitted in with the purpose idea I was thinking about. But uh, an idea of keeping a, a journal, a gratitude journal, uh, where we, we just every few days write down something we're grateful for. I mean, I do this all the time. It's so ingrained in me now. If I walk outside and it's raining, I think, oh, good rain. I like the countryside where I live and it needs rain and the farmers must be glad that it's arrived. If I walk outside and it's sunny, I think, oh, great. I love it when it's not rain, it's nice and warm. <laughs> I look for, every day I look for something to be grateful for, something small. Not because that in some ways has a massive effect on me. It's because again, if I'm waiting for the big thing to happen to make my life great, it, it will happen because I generally think big things happen to everybody that are really good. I'm an optimist completely, but I could be waiting a long time. If I remind myself that the world is full of small bits of joy uh, and I remind myself to be grateful to be in that situation, that is what will keep you going. So, but you have... I think about it and all that lot, but I don't write it down in a journal anymore. But I do think about it at night before I go to bed. Oh, that was good. I'm glad I did this. Oh, that was great. Or you know, my daughter came running into the room and actually I found it amusing as well as stressful. I'm just grateful I could feel like that. That's what on a longer thing, and I know we're running out, I would, I would, if I was doing the things with moral injury and looking at shame, I think self-compassion. Look at some self-compassion exercises. Look at how we look at ourselves and how we behave and how we judge ourselves. I think that is... And I think in one area, I think it's Gilbert. It was Gilbert. I'll get the name. I can't remember. Uh, he's written a book on compassion, which is brilliant. But self-compassion, how to understand. And that really, it, that helps us with things like shame, where we just feel that we're not good enough. And we come away from a mission. We've, we haven't done well, that we failed. Look at this. Yeah, so positive psychology, 
look at self-compassion exercises. That would be, yeah, that'd be another top tip. Kate, <laughs> Kate will be able to tell you lots about this because she's very good at this. Yeah. Thank you um, for the questions. They were good. Yeah. And then, Denise, you, you wanted to say something before? No, thanks. No? OK. <laughs> I thought you were, you, were, you meant to say something. Sorry if we interrupted you. But um, anybody um, else? A, a question yeah. from Stephanie in the chat box. Um, maybe, Mark, do you have any suggestions for a couple of uh, helpful books to take with us on the field? Might be useful. Surely appreciate it. Uh, okay, uh, I've got one book around here that I, I, I'm presently reading. Uh, yeah, this late, and, and lots of these people, uh, and I like this sort of book. It's soft, it's soft science, so they they give you where the research papers come come from, but they digest it so you can do it. <laughs> so mm. like that. Uh, but lots of these people, one thing I would say is lots of these people do lots of really good podcasts. So you can actually listen to them. And lots of them are on Instagram. Well, I'm, I'm amazed at every now and then that I get on Instagram and go, I only follow a few people on Instagram because I can say, ask them a question. And they're fascinated by it and they come back. So I think uh, this one, the upside of stress. Oh, okay. that, that, the upside of stress. And I, one of the reasons I'm going to suggest this one is because it has lots of things in it where it talks about stuff, gives you the research behind it, uh, and you'll be able to read about the social stress experiment, which is just unbelievable. Uh, but it also gives you boxes. So some of the things I've said, oh, you should do this, uh, is from the research that I've read from that book. And it tells you, this is it, this is what it does, these are some interesting bits about it. Here's a box at the end of the chapter, do this. So the upside of stress is probably one I'd take. I would, I would now, I didn't mention it a lot because it's a, a different talk, hostile environment style, uh, and I haven't got a book to hand. So look up, look some reviews. Caitlin might know something, but a, a, a nice book like that with exercises on self-compassion, I think would really help people, really help people so they can learn and understand that. That self-compassion, that humility, that understanding, I firmly believe will, uh, will, will help you through mission but those don't off the top of my head that one okay cool. what else how else can i ask anyone's questions <laughs> thanks a lot mark we have also several uh you know um titles in the chat box very interesting oh yeah. excellent yeah. excellent yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll save it we'll share it we'll share the the suggestions out of the chat yeah. box ah uh, good yeah paul gilbert someone's come up with a compassionate mind paul gilbert that's exactly the book uh, I was think I was thinking of he is I've talked to him he, brilliant yeah just, it's actually it's uh, I'm reading at the moment and it's really helpful there are quite a few uh, exercises very short ones very like mm. light, longer ones and you can use them it's really really good yeah he's a he's a he's an expert he's a genius he's a genius <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a excellent any any other questions we are we are arriving uh, at the end of the webinar. Any other questions? Yeah, hi, this is Sybil. Hi, um, as you, I've, I've been part of this group uh, since the last session we had. Yeah. Uh, very curious to listen to this. By background, I'm a clinical psychologist and a neuroscientist. Oh, wow. <laughs> I find the focus has to be, it's, it's very important what we just talked about, but instead of self-care, the focus mm. has to be also on organizational care. And I always feel that organizations do not prepare properly people who come into field positions to help them. Secondly, I totally support what Mark mentioned in terms of psychological first aid. I think two people need to be on the ground to help each other to support the rest of the team in wherever there is a field location. Uh, organizations don't take that seriously. Um, and when you come back, and I know you have planned to do a group of, you had some posting around people, and we talked about this the last time, uh, in terms of peer support groups, yeah. very important. Um, there needs to be more done. Uh, I think from my work with people who have been tortured, with people who have extreme experience, PTSD, 
if it is really truly PTSD and not uh, another kind of stress effect that has happened. Um, needs to be more than six months to be taken care of. There need, needs to be money put or given to people in some ways to handle this. We need to know that from returning soldiers mm -hmm. that they have years they need to deal with yeah. this. The organizations are responsible for this. And yeah. I've seen it now, and I worked with many different organizations in my 40 years of international work. Organizations do not take on this responsibility. And this has to be pushed by a lobby group. And I don't know how, I don't know if this is the right group, but I'd like to have this discussion um, with you much more so than the self-care because we are all whiteies basically, right? So let's face it, we come from a privileged background more or less. Yeah. This whole thing about self-care that is sort of the Oprah Winfrey effect is like all over the place right now. So, yeah. and it's, people know what to do and it's very helpful to get some tips. But I think how we change systemic problems in organizational structures is the much bigger point. And it's really related to whole, the whole issue of is international aid related to some extent to colonization? And what do we do also with the psychological effects of colonization? I don't want to give a lecture here. <laughs> but I, very important because I tell you this, when I work with my national colleagues in these different settings. And I've been now working for five years since 2014 till last year in Iraq. My colleagues who I train, it doesn't help for me, uh, it doesn't help them to do the breathing thing. <laughs> this is culturally not something they would appreciate or want to do. Uh, especially my young physicians who work in high stress situation on the front lines. Um, we need to think how a system or how even an NGO can work with the government to push that there is respect and understanding for what is going on on the ground. And this is, I don't know how much other people think about this, but to me, I this think... is one of the results of my work after 40 years and thinking about it a lot. Um, we need to think about that more than just the bomb, about moral injury that happens to us or personal mm -hmm. effects in our lives. Thank I, you. Uh, Jamil, I, I very to... much, yeah, I very much appreciate what, what you say and what you contribute here. And I think I would love to talk to you about maybe you also giving us an opportunity to, um, to listen to you. Uh, from your experience and, and, and from your background and, and you know, uh, lifelong work experience in, the, in this area. I think you would have, uh, have a lot to contribute, you know. And I think, you know, I, I know it from myself, um, you know, I, I have a traumatic experience that's now 25 years ago and, and it, it takes time, you know. And, and I think this is something which uh, inspired us, uh, Sebastian and Helen and myself, to, to create, co-create humanity because exactly um, the organizations, they don't invest in what they should be investing. They don't follow up over long term. They don't even remember who was where and what happened to whom. Um, and I think one of the things which I am really committed on is to set up something in, in our organization called Create Humanity, um, a community that stays, you know, that goes on. As for long for, as for long as we need it, you know, and um, it's uh, you know it's it, it's essential. It's absolutely essential, and there's nobody else out there uh, doing it at this point. I think. I I agree. Just to, I wouldn't disagree with one word that Sybil said. Uh, absolutely, and and I think in in the talk, that's why I said this is the self care. It's just a small bit. It's not that. It's absolutely organisational. The idea of the self is supposed to look at us whilst doing all this without that. You could have, I could give you the perfect self-care strategy. If you have not got good organisational support, it will not work. And I agree, the national, the stuff I'm working on, I'll, I'll link in, I'd love to chat with this. The stuff that I'm working on is based around national staff and, and the support they should have. I agree with everything you said. I mean, and that's why I like this group and I like these webinars, but it's not me saying do this. I'm just one small part in a, a bigger discussion about this, but it, it has to be 
I said to organisations, I'm not, I, I'm not going to give you things to give to your staff that are self-care i'm going to give you a structure which you need to put in you need to lead on and your staff self-care will be one small part of that and and if you don't want to do that it's not going to work i don't want my name attached to it because it just will not work and then i'll look i'll feel bad so no i agree perfectly i love that yeah that was great thank you thanks a lot Sibilo. thanks a lot uh, mark we are now arriving at the end of uh, this uh, webinar and uh, really, I would like to uh, thank you, all of you. Thanks a million for being here with us tonight. Another great webinar. Thanks a lot, uh, Mark, for, you know, being on board since the beginning of Co-Create Humanity. So uh, maybe some of you know us already. So Co-Create Humanity has been created in Geneva in August 2019. So we are quite young, but we are trying to do our best to support this community. Um, the, the next uh, webinar will be on the 29th of April with Kate Roberts. Uh, once again, she will continue on what she started in November about burnout in the humanitarian sector. So it's gonna be on the 29th. And then in May, end of May, we will have our first webinar in French with Stéphane Jolie. He's uh, uh, working with the Bioforce uh, um, on security and, and, and stress. And uh, in June, before the summer uh, break, we will have a very interesting webinar with uh, Professor Alain Brunet from the McGill University on uh, the reconciliation therapy uh, and how it could uh, treat uh, PTSD in the humanitarian sector. Um, so guys, thanks a lot for being here with us tonight. Um, as Christophe said at the beginning of this session, we will send you a survey just to ask you how it went and if you want to have any other topics to be raised up by, by co-create co humanity and we do insist on that co-create humanity does exist because of humanitarian workers and for humanitarian workers we won't be able to do the work without you this is really important to spread the word about the existence of this, this community because all we are doing here is, is really for you and as Christoph said yes we started an international um, recruitment uh, to get some peer support specialists. Um, Lynn, thanks a lot for your, for, for your application. And we, we received uh, uh, some more and Beth, of course, and other people. So we will get back to you very soon. And uh, please spread the word about us. And, and thanks a lot for being here tonight and take care. Thank, thank you all. Million. Thanks thank a million for all the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Thank you. Mark, we're staying a little bit.